For those who don't know me, my name is Lynn Klecker. I'm the chair of the Abedians Tracking Endurance Committee here in Victoria. And we've got this Dogs Victoria Accredited Instructor Scheme. Now, I take it that you've all read the scheme and understand the scheme, all right? What it is, it's basically a, an additional accreditation that you as an instructor for a club or for a private area, if you are a Dogs Victoria member, you can apply to be tested. And if you're approved by Dogs Victoria at the standard we have set, you will get that accreditation and you can use it. All right, just a little background to this. We've had this, this basically accreditation running for a long, long time. And many years ago, we stopped getting anybody applying for it because the clubs and the instructors felt that it was obsolete. So in consultation with the clubs, we had lots of meetings at the old showgrounds and we had lots of post-it notes of what they wanted to see. And that's how we came up with the accreditation scheme we have now. Years ago, you used to do it all in one go and it was a really big day. But now we've de decided that it should be at two levels. All right, so we have the Dogs Victoria accreditation, the basic level instructor, which is basically from beginners, which are the most important classes, as all instructors know, right through to novice level. Then we have a master instructor level which goes from open through to UDX. All right, so everybody has to start at the basic level, which is Dogs Victoria Accredited Instructor, and it's all basically in the scheme. Everybody who comes into the scheme has to have passed the eligibility criteria, do the written exam, and then from there you go through a practical examination for the basic level and then... Once you've been an instructor and done another 100 hours instructing at the, hi the higher levels, you can then apply and it's just a practical examination for the master instructor. All right? Now, I know a lot of people have been asking about, oh, why are we doing this? We need everybody. The reason we're having this as a compulsory lecture tonight is that we're getting a lot of questions that we think... We've had, a lot of, we've had quite a few instructors come along and be assessed. Unfortunately, they weren't prepared for what they were going to encounter. So what we've done is Lee Cogley is very kindly going to give you a presentation on what to expect and what we, as Dogs Victoria, expect the instructors to be able to do. Now, some, some of you in this room may have other accreditations. That's fine. But if you want to be a Dogs Victoria we don't just give you it because you have something from some other organisation. You have to get to the standard that we require. That may be higher or lower than what you already have, but we have a set standard. Okay, so there's, if you have these other accreditations, this won't be a problem to you. If you don't have them, it's a way of getting some, you know, feather in your cap for what all the years of you know, instructing you've done at your clubs, and it's also very good for your clubs. Some of you don't belong to clubs. That's another thing we changed. Used to only be if you were with a dog club that you could uh, put yourself forward or the club would put you forward to be assessed. Now you can put yourself forward if you're a Dogs Victoria member. Now, Dogs Victoria in consultation with OTEC has come up that you don't have to have full Dogs Victoria membership to be a Dogs Victoria accredited instructor, but you have to have what they call a companion membership. Now you can, and that must, you must keep that current the whole time that you are a Dogs Victoria instructor, otherwise it'll lapse. Now I've just got the figures off the website to basically tell you. So a companion membership with Dogs Victoria without the magazine will cost you forty one twenty five a year. That's all it costs to keep it current. If you want to get the magazine as well, it's eighty one fifty. All right, so for those who aren't Dogs Victoria members and you're not actually interested in, you know, being involved in any of the disciplines, trialling in any way, but you really love your instructing, that's the way you can do it. All right? Are there any questions? Well, with that, I'll hand over to Lee. Lee's got a, a presentation that hopefully will co cover all your questions and then at the end of that we will have an open mic. Okay, thank you, Lee. Hello everybody and welcome. My firmly held belief since I joined Southern Obedience Club in 1971 is that dogs deserve a learning environment free of pain and frustration. Use of equipment that inflicts pain and is cruel, inhibits learning and is not within the terms of the 
Protection of Cruelty to Animals Act 1968. In Victoria, we're obligated and legislated to work within or face the consequences which are indeed harsh. Dogs Victoria are also obligated to ensure compliance within the terms of the Act. Okay, understanding our students. If we are really dedicated to transforming our students in ways that benefit them, their family and their pets, then it makes sense to know as much about them as possible. A large part of our jobs as dog trainers and behaviour consultants involves interacting with people who make up the human half of our learning team. A large part, um, as human beings, we have an intrinsic need to want to understand other people, their emotions, their thought processes and their actions. A key part of our effectiveness as trainers is being able to interact positively with our students. This means we must present ourselves well and communicate appropriately. When meeting new or prospective students, we perceive and interpret stimuli based on our sensory impressions. A cycle of perception and behaviour follows, and if we get it wrong, can lead us to fundamentally misunderstand their motives, their goals and their actions. We can communicate with powerful words. The secret to understand others depends on our ability to communicate effectively. Words are powerful tools and the choices we make can influence the thoughts, attitudes and behaviours of others. By paying close attention to the language our students use, we can get a greater insight into what they are really trying to say. Then we can respond more appropriately and effectively to them as individuals. How many of us actually listen and pay attention to a student's every word without the distractions of talking to the dogs, delivering treats, or even taking cursory glances at our mobile phones. As the saying goes, two ears and one mouth sums up what our communication should be. Ask questions and then listen carefully to understand more. Ultimately, the process of communicating is about exchanging information. How we say things can be just as important as what we say. By changing, somebody's got a mobile phone on, by changing the impersonation of our voices, we can inject emotions into our messages and make them sound upbeat or downbeat. Body language refers to posture, facial expressions, gestures and movements, all of which can convey their own messages. Research into the human brain shows that emotions are manifested first in our body language before the rational brain catches up nanoseconds later. Therefore, if we're impatient or angry, our body language will reflect this before we have the chance to put words into action. Learning to read students' body language is a useful skill, which will help us understand their intent, if not their specific thoughts. When we are communicating with students, we need to treat them as individuals and recognise they each have different needs expectations and motivations. There is no one size fits all communication style. No one tone of voice or potted message. Each of our senses has different capabilities. In terms of learning, sight and hearing are the two strongest ones. Sight helps us process stimuli from the environment and hearing helps us connect words with visual concepts. Each of the five senses acts as a portal for learning. Every stimulus passes through the portals of the five senses and then into the brain. During a training session, new information is delivered into the short-term memory area or information treatment location. This is where information is examined and if it is important, will be transferred to the long-term memory. If the information is deemed unnecessary, then it is forgotten. More often than not, this process is not a conscious one but rather an unconscious decision. Research suggests the human brain can only hold between five and nine new pieces of information at a time. The size of the information is dependent on the prior knowledge of the student. When students are learning, they actively involve themselves by critically analysing the new ideas and linking them to their existing knowledge. This level of learning leads to long-term memory retention and problem solving. It promotes an understanding and application that can last a lifetime. In contrast, 
surface learning is the silent acceptance of new information and a rote approach. Surface learning leads to shallow retention and does not promote a real understanding or long-term retention of knowledge or skills. How many times have you stood in a class with the instructor, chatting, chatting, chatting away, everybody gets restless, the dogs get restless, and then it's very hard to keep your complex learning going. So um, commonly, we need to keep moving. Rather than stand around and talk too much, we need to deliver the message, move on, and see how much your students retain. Therefore, training for adults must be relevant must be confidential, it must be motivating, it must be engaging, personalised, flexible, reinforcing and retainable. Our students deserve our respect. We need to make our sessions fun, engaging and relevant. Students need to see and experience demonstrations and practical applications. As trainers, it is important that we effectively structure our sessions to prevent the development of frustration. In a nutshell, our role is to identify our students' needs in terms of skills and knowledge, and then help them achieve these competencies by using planned processes so they can train their pets more effectively. At the same time, we must work to create a training environment that is conducive to learning. Our brain reacts in the same way to threats against the self as it does to threats against the body. Because of this, disrespect, shame and humiliation shut down learning as quickly as physical attacks. When I was a brand new instructor, I remember commenting a lady with a lovely chocolate Labrador, oh, your dog's a little bit fat. Oh, I shrink now to think that I said that. And she turned around and said to me, yes, the puppies will be born in four weeks. <laughs> oh dear. I had to back up really, really fast, apologise profusely and never made that same mistake again. Instructors need students and students need instructors. It is a symbiotic approach and we must do our best to provide the best service and clearest paths to learning, free of frustration, pain or humiliation, engendering a clear instructional and non-confrontational path for world's best practice learning. Um, some of these words are from a book by a person called Nikki Tudge. She's the author of People Training Skills for Pet Professionals. Very much well worth reading. All right. Our expectations for the practical assessment that you'll be attending. The practical assessment will be conducted with three testers at a reasonable location for all concerned. We have a very wide state and we have a lot of kilometres to travel, so we try to manage it so that you don't have to travel too far, but that we don't have to travel too far as well. In both novice and masters, there is a set routine, which is in your guidelines, distributed by OTEC, which gives clear rules for conducting the test. First one, and the most obvious one, is to introduce yourself. You don't need to tell them your life history, you just need to introduce yourself, tell them your name, and, and go on to the next thing, which is to identify the exercise being taught. Testers will give you a random exercise from the prescribed list, followed by a second exercise from the same list, relevant to the level of instruction. Describe the purpose of the exercise. Demonstrate how it is taught at the level you are teaching. Engage the handlers and their dogs, and using two different methods, begin. You do not have to produce a result on the day. However, handlers need to go home with a clear understanding of how to teach that exercise. Testers must be satisfied that handlers understand what is being taught, why it is useful and its applications, and how it is done within this framework. Novice instructor or UDX master instructor and current Dogs Victoria ANKC rules for competition trials. How dogs learn? They learn through engagement. The basic ingredients needed to train in obedience are not just critical for obedience training, they are the cornerstones of good training practices. For training to be successful, the dog needs to be participating actively, which means focused on the handler, engaged and invested in the training process. A dog that is engaged knows that his payments come from the handler and is motivated to work for the human. But how do you build engagement? 
Is it the handler's job to get the dog's attention or is it the dog's job to request the handler's attention? Clear communication, characterised by simple, uniform, consistent cues without extraneous noise and indicating an opportunity for reinforcement forms the foundation of a good training relationship. Understand that there are many different styles of training. A pat to a dog can be just as rewarding as a bucket full of food. Depends on your dog. So you need to choose how you're going to train your dog, but be sure that you motivate your dog, engage it and get that good foundation going. For dogs, it's making the choice, and it must be a choice, to look to the handler. The choice is driven by the knowledge that the handler has some kind of reinforcement that the dog wants, that the dog understands that he can access it through his behaviour, and that he's physically, mentally and emotionally able to pay attention and earn it. I've seen dogs in obedience uh, clubs that are clearly unable to sit well, clearly unable to walk well, clearly unable to lie down promptly. You need to offer your opinion that this dog is struggling. You cannot offer a veterinary opinion, that's up to a vet to do, but you can, unlike my fat Labrador story, you can actually say, I think your dog is struggling, have you thought of going to a vet and seeing what's wrong? So don't just assume that because the dog is limping, uh, unable to get up or down, that you need to persist with that dog. It's important that the dog's health and well-being comes first. Okay, each repetition of wait, choose, reinforce puts deposits in the bank account you have with your dog. Over time, rehearsing these skills and repeating this scenario over and over develops a, a powerful reinforcement history. The cumulative weight of reinforcement history is what defines the training relationship. When you sit down with a clicker and treats, or you lead, or, you, or just you're patting and you're praising, whichever is your particular thing, your dog should be actively trying to access that reinforcement. In a puppy that will probably look like throwing his body at you, pouring or nibble at your hands, a savvier dog may look up at your face or perform one of his favourite little behaviours and glance significantly at the source of reinforcement. When you see those behaviours, you know your dog is engaged and that tells you that the stuff you have will actually function as reinforcement within the training session. If your dog knows you have food but continues to go off sniffing the grass, then the food is probably not going to function as a reinforcer. It won't strengthen any behaviour for practical purposes. Either your dog doesn't want the food or the way to access it, the behaviour to perform, is so unclear or so difficult that your dog decides that the food is not worth the effort. Either way, you can't train yet. You can show your dog the food, put it right in front of his nose, call his name, smooch, snap your fingers, shuffle your feet or generally prompt or nag your dog into looking at you and maybe he'll take a treat or two to appease you. That's not building a training relationship. When your dog feels overwhelmed by the environment and you repeatedly request, cue or demand his attention, you are adding to his stress and likely making yourself an aversive. I see that over and over again, that the dog just shuts down, looks away, refuses to engage because you have become something aversive to the dog. The best way to avoid sliding into that dynamic is to flip it around. Let the dog request your attention. That's a hard leap to make for any of us, especially those who came through, come through the pet training system. We were taught that you should never let a dog demand your attention. Don't reinforce that. It creates bad behaviours, bad habits, we were told, and it's not wrong. Inappropriate behaviours performed to access reinforcement or demand behaviours are often the root of annoying pet dog behaviour problems. I'm working with a dog at the moment that has continual barking problems. And the owner said to me, why does he continually bark at me? I said, okay, when you go to uh, make his food and he barks at you, what do you do? She said, I tell him he's a naughty boy and he should be quiet. So I said, okay, he's accessing your attention by you talking to him. Why don't you just leave the room? And she looked at me and she said, what for? And I said, well, you're reinforcing the dog for barking at you, so change the situation. 
Two days later, she rings back and she says, my dog now sits and waits for his dinner very quietly, looking at me very hard, saying, don't move out of the room. I'm not getting fed if you go, so you just stay right there. All right. Demand behaviours are often the root of annoying pet dog behaviour problems. That's just one simple example of it. Embracing appropriate demand behaviours is a significant difference that we need to absorb when we move up to performance training level. A performance dog, in obedience or any other sport, that demands to work with you is not a problem. It's a feature. That is exactly what you want. Of course you want to put some context on the demanding behaviour, when, where and what categories of behaviour will be reinforced so that you can still live with the dog. However, in general, you want your dog pushing you in every training session. Wait for your dog to be ready. Wait for him to voluntarily turn to you and seek reinforcement that you control. This requires a really huge shift in thinking. Instead of you demanding, asking the dog all the time, I want my dog to want to work for me, to demand that I get out those nice treats, to demand that I pat him, demand that I play with him, and that's the way you'll get it. It's a lot of impulse control on your part, but it's more than worth the effort. Learn to know when your dog is ready, and that's when you start your training session. <laughs> Most of these words are from an, an ex excerpt from a book that is in our library that you all should have a copy of. It's called Awesome Obedience and it's by a lass called Hannah Brannigan. Very, very common sense lady, done a lot of competition obedience work and you, it's in our library so you really need to access that. All right, teaching new exercises. What is it? Why is it? And how is it is my most commonly used phrase. Class levels of training, depending on the size of the class you are teaching and the level of ability individual dog handler teams have already acquired, is the common makeup of obedience train class, training classes. You can only move forward at the slowest pace of the slowest dog handler team. Being clear about the above heading will help you break down the exercise to the most basic level, building up from there. Spouting obedience rules to a new beginner is not helpful. Advise them where to read the rules, download them from the ANKC website, there's a link on the paperwork that you have, and encourage teams to read and absorb what the rules are and to gain a picture of competition obedience correctly. I routinely tell my students to put the obedience rules beside their bedside, read a paragraph before you go to bed, turn the light off and it sinks into your long-term memory very quick. But if you read the rules while the children are demanding to be fed, the dogs want to go out, the phone's ringing and your husband's asking where's his best suit or where's his shoes that he needs to go running, you will not retain that. So give yourself quiet time just before you go to bed, read just a portion of the rules and then you'll find that they, you retain that very, very well. Okay, explain why an exercise is taught. Stand for examination is a necessary skill for all dogs to be handled. Veterinary examinations, personal care examinations of the feet, the mouth, the coat, the skin, the body, all contribute to our ability to live well with the dog. It is a maintenance issue that moves into competition obedience. The recall is a requirement under current laws for off-lead dogs in parks. You may find that hard to believe when they all swarm up to your dog and you hear somebody 500 metres away saying, puppy, come over here, and you know puppy's not listening and it's making a beeline for your dog. Under the Protection of Cru Cruelty to Animals Act 1968, you may have your dog off lead, however, you will have to have a competent recall. We're not quite there yet, but we're really working on it. The recall is a life-saving exercise. The drop-on recall is an emergency stop if the dog is running onto a road or into danger. Healing off lead is another useful exercise if your lead breaks or if you're having issues with dogs crowding around your dog. The ability to call your dog to heal and walk to the car can be life-saving. I hear the chant, oh, he only wants to say hi. <laughs> yes, and you know that if you've got a slightly nervous dog or if you've got a dog that is a little aloof and does not want to engage with 400 dogs down on the beach, he shouldn't have to. However, it's your job to look after your dog and it's the other person's job to look after their dog. I've had people scream at me from a long distance away he only wants to say hi, he's friendly. And I say, and I hope this doesn't come out too loudly, mine's not. 
<laughs> wow, do you, do you want to see them just dive on their dogs and head out back to their car? My dog's friendly, but I really don't want a number of dogs coming up and swarming all over my dog when I don't particularly want that to happen. All obedience exercises are not tricks for the competition ring. They are useful and necessary for a canine good citizen to live, and, live with and work with us. They demonstrate that we are responsible for our dog's health and welfare. Class instructors should call for play breaks during the class. Throwing of balls can be dangerous in a large class, so manage the levels of obedience your class dis displays and offer advice accordingly. You may want to play with tuggy toys. You may want to just sit down and pat and cuddle your dog. You, you will structure your class depending on the needs of the dogs and the needs of the handlers. Some, um, can I say men, are a bit reluctant to horse around. They shut down. You say, play with your dog, and they go, what? What do you mean, play with your, play with your dog? What, what do you do when you're telling your dog that you love it to pieces? Oh, good girl, good, good boy. No, 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 no. You've got to be a lot more animated than that. You have to pay out to the dog exactly what you want to get back. So you need to be very sure that when you're um, having balls and tuggy toys and, and praise sessions going on, that you spread your class out, give them lots of room to be able to do that. But if you have play breaks, you'll find your class will go so much better than if you drone on for an hour and then send everybody off to go home. A simple release of go play, or I use huzzah! <laughs> My dog's going nuts when I do that. Or even a sibilant sound like psst. Um, or words that don't conflict with obedience trial cues are always a good idea. Finish is the cue the judges give at the end of a recall, therefore finished would probably not be appropriate. That's it can be misconstrued for sit. A dog's name of Fay can be confused with stay. Go party is a pretty popular expression of release and go play. Use whatever particular phrase or word usage that you want to do, but make sure that your dog clearly knows that means we're done for a little bit and we're going to go and have a little bit of a play, then we're kind of going to come back into work again. You'll get uh, a lot more out of your dogs in a class if you have play breaks. Don't think that you have to be serious and strong for a whole hour. All right. We're looking for a start and finish cue. Are you ready is the cue a judge gives you before performing a competition exercise. Therefore, it's inconsistent with a get ready cue. If you use yes as a verbal marker, in training in the competition ring and you don't reinforce that behaviour, there's a build-up of lying to your dog. If you say yes and the dog doesn't get the reinforcement that it expects, even if you think you can say yes seven, eight, nine times and eventually reinforce something, the dog will sit there and blink at you and go, I really don't get that. So I think that dogs are fairly simple creatures. They need to be very sure of what it is that you want and why you want it. Consider responding with, when the judge asks you, are you ready? Consider responding with, I am, or we are, when the judge asks, are you ready? Rather than saying, oh, I am, <laughs> or maybe. No, you need to be in charge of your dog. And when the judge says, are you ready? Bang, you say, yes, I'm ready. But don't try and get that yes word out of there. So swap it for, I am, or we are, and sound confident, because that's what goes down the lead to the dog. Dogs Victoria has an amazing library with committed and determined volunteer staff who are happy to assist you with CDs, DVDs and books to further your learning. Remember they're volunteers if you're inclined to criticise. If you don't want to do their job for them, don't criticise. Give assistance politely and remember to thank the volunteers for their help. Alright, I think we're ready to go open to questions now. Sue? Have I bamboozled you with science and you're all not going to speak? No, come on, give me questions. <laughs> put, put your hand up and wait for acknowledgement. I'm just a little bit confused about the lower level instructor. Right. Um, it, it seems to me, is, is the, perp the aim of the lower level instructor, is that... Um, in relationship to the approved training organisation with the Victorian government? Lynn? It is. Um, 
if it is, why is in, in, in the master instructor, I can understand why there's so much emphasis on trialling. Yep. But in the lower one, I would have thought there seems to be a lot of emphasis on trialling when really I think it should be directed towards um, responsible pet ownership. Because that, as an affiliate, we probably only have 2% of our members that actually go on to trial. There's all this emphasis on... You see what I mean? To me, at the master level, I understand the emphasis on trialling and promoting trialling. But the lower level one, to me, there seems, in the literature, there seems to be a hell of a lot of emphasis on, on competition when really I don't think it's relevant to um, responsible pet ownership. The basic level of instructors is basically so that you can show that you can train a dog to that level. They don't have to go and trial, but you can train it to that level. Just as Lee's just explained, teaching a recall, a novice recall, can be you know, a great asset to your dog, same as off-lead healing. These are all things that are done up to novice level. So it's not necessarily that they have to trial, but you as an instructor have to be able to teach them how to train their dog to do these things. So maybe the emphasis you're reading into it is more than than was intended because it's just that you need to be able to do that level of exercises to get that level of accreditation. Just in relation to the explanation of the practical assessment, it states um, engage the handlers and their dogs and using two different methods. <coughs> Just in regards to that, are they specific types already explained somewhere or are they your type of methods? Because there's many different type of methods. You can, you can understand there are a lot of clubs that teach in a lot of different ways, so we're not trying to standardise what the clubs do. We want to see your level of expertise and we want to see that you can do it more than one way. You might have a person who is a bit um, bright, busy, catches it, gets on with it very fast, but the rest of your class don't necessarily do that. So you may have to explain in a different fashion a, a slightly different way to do that. For instance, just to sit. I mean, every, what's the first thing we do with a baby puppy? We teach it to sit for its dinner. So you might say to um, one particular person, um, pull up, push down, say sit if you use a manual approach. You might lure it with food if you use a food click reinforce approach. And if somebody doesn't get that, what are you going to do? You have to have an extra level of instruction that will challenge that person who didn't get it. You don't want anybody to walk away from a class saying, oh, okay, I don't want to feed my dog, I don't want to do that to make my dog sit. What else can you teach me? Show me a different way. And it's the same with drops, it's the same with recalls. I mean, you, you have to have a level of expertise that convinces us when we test you that you do have a broad amount of knowledge rather than just one single vein of knowledge. Yeah? Right. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, and, and in actual fact, I was going to the extreme of the masters so that you would have multiple levels in the way of doing broad jumps, directional jumps, yes. that sort of thing. Yeah, yes. that's fine. Yeah, some, some, um, some dogs are not physically terribly good at jumping, so you might have to say, um, this dog needs more of a run-up and the dog is struggling having this, so we'll break it down into just doing this small portion of the broad jump. Another dog might be very active, very busy, and you'll just get the dog over really quickly, so you don't need to show that dog that the, uh, the easier way to do it because it doesn't need it. But we need to see that you have that expertise, that if, if group A does it this way and group B does it this way, that you're not disenfranchising one half of your class. Yeah? It's all about your, your level of expertise and your ability to put that over. Yeah? Anybody else? Just two questions, if I may. First, is there any associated cost with the scheme? Um, the, the wonderful thing is this is an initiative of Dogs Victoria and OTEC, who I think really need um, some pretty high praise for what they're trying to do. Um, no, there's no cost to it. You simply apply and um, Lynn and her wisdom sorts out where, when and how, and we invite you to come along and do it. Okay, that, that's great. 
Now, secondly, the, the notes are really great. For those that are attending, can they share those notes with other fellow instructors? Of course. Of course, this is all just a, this is no secret society, you know, where we have this little closed group. This is this is just general information on dog training. Whether you choose to do it the way that I've discussed or not is entirely up to you. My only rider to that would be um, no harsh methods and making sure that the dogs understand. So you use whatever method you feel is valid, and if you get the result on the day, we're not going to criticise that. No, that's great. I can only see more uh, instructors that aren't participating participate in the future. Well, that's good. That's very good to hear. Thank you. The only rider is, as I said at the start, is you have to be a member of Dogs Victoria, yep. all right, to be accredited by Dogs Victoria. I think it's pretty common sense. But we've managed to negotiate with Dogs Victoria that you don't have to take out that full membership, you know. You first join and you want to go and show your dog and you want to do obedience and you want to go tracking, you want to do everything. That's a big outlay right, when you register your dog. If you just want to do this part of it, you can just take out that companion membership with or without the magazine and just keep it current. So it only costs you $40, $41.25 a year. And some clubs may decide that it, it is such a good thing to have that they may even subsidise some of that for some of you. That's entirely up to them. But if you want to do it just on your own, that's all you have to have. Where are all the workshops going to be held? Am I? Oh, okay, that's that's good to know. I just learned something new, have you? <laughs> um, <laughs> workshops. We 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 suffer from the tyranny of distance a little bit. It's a it's an amazing thing that Dogs Victoria and OTEC have elected to live stream this, so that all of our country instructors actually get the same opportunities that everybody that's able to come here do. We will do them at Buller as well because that's the other side of the city. Um, the difficult thing for, for me is to travel a long way. So if I were to go to, let's say, Warrnambool to do this at night, I would have to stay over in Warrnambool and come home the next day. And I mean, we, I guess we're sort of prepared to do that a bit, but um, we have to make it as, as broad as the whole of, state of, whole state of Victoria. And that's not an easy thing to do. So I understand your question, and we we are working towards that. If I win Tats, Lo Tats Lotto tomorrow, well, probably be a lot easier to do that. So with the dog assessments, mm -hmm. uh, Dave, will some of those be held over, at, say, at Tullamarine and some here? At the Buller Training Centre, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We're trying to broaden it as much as we can because it's an impost on everybody from the country to try and get down here and we, we want everybody in Victoria to have the same equal opportunity to come and be a, dog, a licensed Dog Victoria instructor. That's why we're putting so much work into getting this right. So at the moment you don't know where they're actually going to be held then? we we'll sort of depend on the applications we get, won't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, what we're hoping to do is sort of have Testing days, like let's say we'll run one in Shepparton and then everyone from around the area, for example, I'm not saying we're going to do it, but we'll pick and maybe one at Geelong and they can come up from Warrnambool and Portland and, and all those surrounding areas and then we'll do one on the other side of town maybe at Sale and they can come from Morwell and Bernsdale and stuff like that. That's for assessment. Please remember, OTEC and Dogs Victoria do not train instructors. This is not a training Thing. It's an accreditation. You've done all that work. The clubs, some of you have trained for years at clubs. They've done all that hard work. They've taught you all that you know and you've perfected that. All this is is your way of coming out and getting an accreditation for all that work. And Dogs Victoria is very happy for you to do that. That's why we have a standard that you have to do. So the workshop is basically only to show you. We've got one um, on the list, I think, um, coming up that you can come and it's just to show you what's expected of you on the test day because what we don't want you to do is come along and be overawed by it all when it's pretty obvious that we've had people who've got the knowledge but when they see what they have to teach, who they, you know, like they've given a class of dogs to do something with and they get that nervous that they can't do it but every other day of the week they'd be able to do it back at their club. All right, so it's just a matter of getting you accustomed to what to expect. As, as, as a tester, I see people that uh, just shut down. 
you know, we say, right, this is an exercise, go and show us two ways to do that. And they, they just look like a rabbit in the headlights. Their brain completely goes into another state and they fumble and they worry. Now, I know that nobody that applies to be a, a licensed instructor doesn't know what they're talking about. It's whether you can produce it on the day. And we're, we're very tolerant. We try to be welcoming, we try to be friendly, but at the end of the day, you do have to deliver because this is not a license that is easy to obtain. It's a whole lot of, it's years of work on your, your knowledge base of, of training at dog clubs, and we want you to shine. We want you to be the best you can actually be. Yeah. And we, Sue. Um, I'd been with Dogs Victoria for about four and a half years, but I came from Queensland and I was in um, Dogs Queensland yep. before it was CCQ, I think the name was. It's all was confusing, isn't it? No. Yeah. Um, would that be recognised by Dogs Victoria? Because I've actually circled to do the, the, the CCD bus plus the Masters. Lynn can answer that question. Yes. Any member body, if you can prove that you've been a member? That will count to the continuous membership as long as you've had continuous membership with any member body in Australia. Okay. When are the practical assessments likely to p take place, i.e. which month? Uh, they'll be after the written exam. We will do some before Christmas and some after Christmas. But can I use this opportunity to say to the clubs is that we may need your help to do this because the hardest part is getting the beginner dogs in. So perhaps one thing we could explore, if there are two um, clubs, one group of instructors can go to one club and take part of a class and then they can do it reciprocally. Can, because we cannot test people on the class that they are taking. You can't know the dogs and things. Okay? Uh, uh, I hope that answers the question. I've got another one. I'll grab this. The, the page keeps refreshing. Uh, the novice instructor you talk about says that you just need to be a companion member. But to be a novice instructor, the Dogs Victoria document says that you must have trained a dog to CD level. Please explain. The documentation actually says to novice standard. Novice standard does not mean that you have to have a novice title. We tend to use those things saying CCD and CD because people understand it who are in the dog world. It says novice standard, all right? So you may have trained a dog to novice standard at your own club competitions. As long as you can verify that, it's novice standard. I can train a dog up. Novice standard, it might have one pass novice, it may have none, but it can do the novice work, all right? So you've just got to get that verified by your club, all right? You've trained it to that standard. How are you going to verify that people who have actually instructed for their minimum of 100 hours? They have to give us the information to verify. We go back to the, if they're doing it at a club or if they're doing it privately, we have to have they have to give us the information so we can verify. So if you put down that you've, tra you've instructed 100 hours for the German Shepherd Club, Sorry, Diane, but I know that's where you're from. We go straight back to the German Shepherd Club and say, can you verify this for us? It's a little more difficult when it's somebody who doesn't train at a club. And I, I guess we have to have um, a little bit of faith in people's honour yes. that if they say that they've done that, they have to. It will be very clear very quickly if they haven't. Mm -hmm. yeah.
just a very quick one. The actual um, assessment process, roughly how long do you expect that to take? Five minutes, 10, 20? What's your average? Um, you know, I know it depends yeah, on yeah, the yeah. dogs and the handlers. It's, it's a piece of string answer. Yeah. Um, it depends on, ha on the crispness of the, in the instructor. If they get on with it and, and get going, um, probably 25 minutes, maybe 30 maximum. If they have a difficulty with the dog and they have to really break things down, then it's going to take a bit more explanation. We try not to have overqualified dogs there because if you say, can your dog pick up a dumbbell and, and you say, do it, well, <laughs> that's not really teaching us that you know how to get a dog to do it. So um, it, it, the, the balance we try to strike is some dogs that can't, some dogs that can. And let me tell you, it's not easy getting somebody to stand there for um, half an hour, three or four times on a very cold, wet, windy day in Melbourne like we did a couple of weeks ago. Um, so if we ask you, any of you to come along and bring a dog along to help, I hope that your answer is going to be great, we'll be there, because we really need you to, to give us that assistance. We tend to only assess three dogs at a time, yeah. because three, three dogs, sorry, three instructors at a time, all right, because as Lee said, it takes a long process and if you're using, if you haven't got multiples of dogs, it's all, it turns yeah. into a very long day for yeah. you. Yeah. We've got some home questions now. Lee, with rewards, what sort are we to use and how? Is it just food or are tugs, balls, etc. appropriate? Will we, will we be supplying in case those in the class don't have any, as is often the case? That's another piece of string answer. It's up to the instructor to apply a method. So if the dogs are normally trained with food, most of the handlers will have the big bag on their pocket. If most of the dogs are trained with toys, most of the handlers will have that. If it's just purely praising and patting, then that's always on your tongue, isn't it? So it's, it's, a, it's up, entirely up to the instructor what they can get out of dogs. Now, if they get a group of dogs and they cannot get um, the explanation through. It's not whether they get the result on the day, it's whether they get the explanation through so the handlers can go home and work on their dogs, clearly understanding what it is that the, it's the what, the why and the how of what they're doing. So we don't tell you what you can do, we leave it up to you to decide whether you can get that result out of the group of handlers that you finish up with. Yeah, Does, do you think that answers the question? I think that answers the question. Okay. Uh, they'll tell me if it's not, don't worry. Uh, the next question is, can you please elaborate on the written exam and what requirements are there, i.e. number of questions, types of questions, pass mark, etc. No, no, that's, that's your, your bow, Wick, Lynn. Um, uh, we are... Uh, the, the number of questions is, um, I, I don't, I'm not sure that that is actually relevant. The, the types, of, types of questions is included in the scheme. There will be some small, small paragraph answers, um, a lot of multiple choice. We do not want war and peace. Um, we sort of want a comic strip. We're asking for dot points. So dot point answers are encouraged. So uh, if you have a look, we have put a couple of uh, examples of questions in the actual scheme. Um, there will also be some questions on body language of the dog. Now we will be putting in photos, we will be asking what do you think this dog is showing? And we will try and use clear photos and there may be a number of interpretations, that's fine. Um, pass mark, we, we expect 80% pass mark. Um, we, when I say the number of questions is not relevant, it, it is a significant paper. We expect, we, we are allowing one and a half hours, but we don't expect you to take a full one and a half hours, but we don't want to rush people. 
We also want to encourage people that, who may not have done a lot of education that it's okay. It's, it's not like you're not doing a PhD, okay? So if you're concerned about the written paper, then we welcome the opportunity to help you, okay? If it, if it concerns you, there is also an oral option. However, you will be answering the same questions and the, as it says there, the candidate, it's not a discussion. You're just dictating the answers. So if it worries you to write things down, and, and that, that's, that is some people. Particularly if your um, native language is, is not English. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Um, now I have another one. Boy, they're getting... Oh, I said thank you, I answered his question. Isn't that nice? Um, if you have attained the VCA instructor's licence from many years ago, does that equal the master instructor under this scheme? No, that just goes up to the, the first level, Dogs Victoria. If you are a Dogs Victoria instructor, you are a Dogs Victoria instructor at the first level. You can then, if you are a Dogs Victoria instructor, you can apply to be tested as a master instructor. Because back in those days, they didn't cover UD and UDX. So, you have to, if you want to be a master instructor, you have to show us that you know how to train those exercises. You can impart that knowledge to someone how to train their dog to that level. And just going back to the other thing, the, the people who have already gone through the scheme, because we have got master instructors that have gone through, we had a backlog, and now we've opened it up to everybody. Um, we've got master instructors, we've got uh, Dogs Victoria accredited instructors. And the, the written paper from memory was about 40 questions. We gave them an hour and a half and I don't think there was anybody left in the room after 45 minutes. Just to give you an idea. But as Sue very rightly said, we don't want to rush anyone. If you want to sit there and really think about your questions, it's not a race. You don't get any better marks for finishing fast. It's not rally. You know, the faster you go through the course, the better it is. It's not that. We want to know that you know your stuff. And if it takes you an hour and a half to write it down, so be it. <laughs> All right? Just want to make that very clear. But if you know you're instructing, you won't have a problem with the written paper. It isn't, you know, rocket science. It's what okay. you know and what you're training every week. Um, you know how you said that you'd um, welcome members from clubs with their dogs, as most clubs probably close over that December, January period. Um, I'm sure our club would be interested in putting people up with their dogs. Um, we'd have to know in advance when the dates were so we could get them. And what sort of level of dog do you want? A new person that's got no idea, some dog that's got a little bit of an idea, um, or what? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't want to do them over to December and January. We want, to, we want to have a break too. Yeah, well, we want to do... We're going to do some testing before Christmas. So that's, like, before the end of the year and then we won't be doing any more until probably... It's a little bit cooler, maybe about March, <coughs> April. Once the clubs are back, settled down. For the beginner's level or the, the starter's level, what we're after is dogs, a mixture, as Lee said, a mixture of ones... We don't want first day people with their dogs all out of, you know, they all come up and they've got the best dog in the world and they have and they're all jumping all over the place. That is not what we're after. We're after after they've had two or three weeks at the club, they know that basically that how to, you know, how to hold their lead for a start. That's always a good start. And then we've got half of them, oh, well, some of them don't know how to do that sometimes. And, um, and then we've got half the class that are a little bit more progressed up depending on how your class structure is. You know, they already know how to do things because they're the ones that they'll be teaching how to do the novice, more so the novice exercises with. All right? Um, because of the timeline being a few months apart of, for everything, the proposed ANKC rule changes, do we have any idea when they may come into effect, the obedience rules changes? 
the obedience rule changes, they don't go to national committee until March next year. We've just put in the Victorian submission. Submissions went in on 30th of June. Um, we won't get back all the submissions until we hope by October. Then we'll have meetings to discuss them. And then we'll go to national committee in Adelaide in March. And then it will be the following year, so 2021, when the new... Not on this, till 2021 before the new rules for obedience and rally come in. Okay, I'm going to summarise about four questions. Uh, where is there any chance of doing the written exam online, and where if where will it take place, and how many people? What's the percentage of people who have passed their written exam? Uh, I th from memory, I think about 95% of people passed. Would that be right, Lee? Yeah, oh, you weren't involved. Is that about, about right? Yeah, yeah, it was, so it's a very high percentage. Um, you can't do the written exam online. You can arrange to do a distance exam with an appropriate invigilator. Now, that is likely to be someone like um, uh, an obedience or performance judge or someone who, you know, of that sort of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or a, a, a teacher or you know, someone who has got some authority. They can, you can do that exam there. We will have a... a we will send the exam to that person and then uh, they will arrange for it but it must be done at the same time as the written exam because it's the same exam and uh, then they will post the exam back or hopefully email it back or something. Uh, I think that's, yeah. We do this with our judges. We have judges that live all over the state and when they're doing their written exam, they don't all come to Buller to do them. We send them down to an approved organisation like a TAFE or somewhere and they've organised it and those papers are sent there and they, they sit the exam at the same time they're sitting it at Buller and then it's uh, by an accredited person and then it's sent back to us at Dogs Victoria to be marked. So it happens everywhere. People do distance exams all the time. You've just got to get the accredited people with the credentials who can do it. Sue, have you got a date for the written exam yet? Um, 9th of October. So those who put in their paperwork, you don't have to put it in tonight. You can send your application in um, by email if you wish or drop it off on the desk but send it to Sue Murray and then we'll collate them all and then you'll be invited to come if, you, if all your credentials work out you'll be invited to come on the 9th of October to the written exam. The obvious question, will you have the written exam available at Buller and KCC on the same day? We went through a number of different dates trying to find a date when there was the rooms were going to be available at Buller and at KCC Park at the same time. That is our hope and I had and I have now just remembered that I didn't confirm that before the office shut today. So that's my bad, we'll send out an email. Um, but we were going to send out an email anyway. Now I've got some queries about the workshop. Now the reason that we didn't send out the details about the workshop first is that we 
with with this was we were getting a bit inundated with emails, um, all asking the same questions and getting a bit confused. So the workshop is on Saturday, and you'll get all this in the email in the next couple of days. But just to so people know that we're doing that. We have sent you the date, but this is the program. It's Saturday, the August the 31st, and it's at KCC Park. So um, Lee Cogley and Greg Bobbin are doing uh, a session on helping owners and handlers set up a puppy for life. Uh, Kerry Piper is doing a session on identifying canine body language. Lorna Piper is doing a session on making training fun. And after lunch, it's a BYO lunch, uh, there will be a question and answer session on issues that you are having as an instructor. Not a question and answer on the scheme, but as an instructor. Okay? So there we are. Uh, and while I've got the microphone, I've got another question. Um, will the novice and master's exam take place on the same night? Yes, because it's the same exam. There's one written exam. There's two practical assessments. Okay? Thank you. Okay, just to make that clear, everybody sits the same exam. You only sit a written exam for the entry level. Once you've proven to us that, then you're invited to do the Dogs Victoria Credit Instructor exam. If you pass that, then you go away and do all your, your work and everything and come back and apply later for the Master Instructor, if you wish. A lot of people may not wish to go that high. They're quite happy doing the most important part, which is the beginning. We all know how you can make and break, and that's why it's very important setting up a puppy for life. You can make or break a, a puppy and its future at the club, all right? So some people may not want to go on to Masters, but there's only one written exam. You do that and it is current. If you fail, it's all in the scheme, if you fail your practical, your written examination will hold for 12 months. So you can reapply to be assessed again. As Lee mentioned about people who, you know, get very nervous and, you know, sort of can't do it the first time and anyway then they get used to it they come back and they they do very well the second time so as long as you do it within 12 months you don't have to sit your written paper again because the paper will get changed won't be the same paper for the next five years it, but the one you do will hold good for 12 months Uh, yeah, just a, a quick one. Um, I'll try and make it simple. Um, so if you get uh, 50 uh, candidates uh, doing their um, exam and you get 50 who pass and they want to do their um, practical assessments, uh, have you got a strategy in place on how you're going to do those 50? Is it a period of time Is it that you would envisage this is going to take? Well, as to said before we need to have the dogs in place we have panel members who can assess, assess they've been through the train the trainer scheme we have two panels of master instructors that can assess so they don't have to all be assessed on the same week but we could probably do three six each week it won't take long to go through if it all comes down to availability of people we all have lives outside of dogs even though a lot of our partners don't think so um, but we do have lives outside of dogs. But the thing is, if the panels are available, they will be there if we can get the dogs for, to be assessed, to use in the assessment. Will there be, like, maybe during the weekday, maybe, or just all weekend? We hadn't thought about during the week, but that's not something, that's something that we could look at if we have some people. Hmm. That's something we can look at. Because most people are only available on the weekend and getting dogs is the only time they can do it. And that then becomes a bit difficult for some of us who are involved in lots of things. But yeah, there's no reason we couldn't do it midweek if the dogs and the assessors were available and the, pe and the candidates were available. So that would be during the week, but later. 
Sorry. So you're saying that the um, uh, written exam is the the entry requirement level, mm -hmm. and if you want to do that, can you then also then do the practical for the entry and the masters at the same time, or do you have to wait 12 months? No, you have to pass your Dogs Victoria accredited instructor first, yeah. and then if you've got the hours up, as it says, mm -hmm. at the higher level, and you can do that, you can apply. You've got you've basically got to do the first level then go away and do your instructing and whatever else and then reapply for the master level. On next Saturday's um, workshops, is it going to be streamed? No, no. It's, it's, we're very grateful to, for Dogs, to Dogs Victoria for having allowed us the opportunity to do live streaming. Um, it's not a cheap process, so we push it as hard as we can, but I don't know that the budget will cover that. We, we would like to do that, so if you want to donate to a fund, yep, go ahead. <laughs> um, if we um, can't negotiate streaming it, we will record it. Um, so uh, we can record it and then put it up later, but we will have to advise you um, as to what we're doing on that. But we, um, at quarter to five t tonight, started um, negotiations, shall we say. Okay, any more questions? Oh my gosh, we've talked ourselves dry. That's fantastic. <laughs> Will there only be one workshop? I would envisage that there will be more. This is, we're, in, we're in its infancy of doing this with the um, master's level as well. And it's a wonderful initiative from OTEC to be able to organise this. Uh, we're, all, we're all volunteers, none of us get paid for doing any of this and time's precious so we'll put as much time into it as we can possibly manage and ultimately we'll get through a backlog and then it'll get a lot easier. No more questions? More a suggestion than a question. If you're going to video the workshop if you make that available to clubs for a small fee, that could be very beneficial. We take that on advisement. Is that what the politicians say? We'll yeah, take that we'll take that under advisement. Thank <laughs> yes. you very much. <laughs> but thank you for the suggestion. Any more questions? All right. Well, that being the case, I think the live feed can basically finish. But first of all, I'd like to really thank um, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, my my pleasure. Um, in the past, what was the pass rate for the practical component? Um, we had about a fifty-fifty, maybe slightly less than that, because we had a few rabbit in the headlights um, presenters who just sort of didn't handle it very well on the day, didn't mean that they didn't know what they were um, trying to instruct, it was just that they were struggling with that. And I think as this goes along, the, the general knowledge will be that you present well, you stand up and you, you advocate for what you think is right about dog training and that we are not the enemy. We're there, to, we're there to help you pass, but you do have to clearly show us that you have the knowledge and the ability to do that. Otherwise, a master instructor or a novice instructor becomes just a piece of paper. We want you to treasure that. We want it to be up on your wall and we want you to be proud of it. Yep. Um, can you um, give a couple of uh, ideas of how people could best prepare for the practical component? Sure. Um, the, the mirror is your friend. If you go and set up a mirror and you talk to the mirror about what you're going to do, 
Um, you could gather a, a group of friends as well and, and you could practice on them. Um, I know I practiced on my five-year-olds. <laughs> they had no idea what I was talking about, but they were a great audience, so you need, you need that practical experience. Plus, or you could also draw on your club. There are, there are many instructors in your clubs who should be able to coach you and help you. So it's not you on your own trying to do this. Call on the expertise of others around you. But the thing is to practice, practice, practice. And like we say to people training their dogs, don't forget to do your practice at home. Yeah. Any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> Just for those that have got the um, companion membership, we've still got access to the library. Still oh, the, the library is an amazing resource. When you walk in there, you'll be overwhelmed with how much is in there. And the library staff do a fantastic job of sourcing new and modern ways of training. So they, they have to get online and have a look at the catalogue of stuff that's in there. It's just oh, yeah. truly wonderful. Yep. Yeah, utilise the, the facilities here at Dogs Victoria at the park. Those who live close, you're blessed. But even if you're down here on the weekend, it's quite often, quite often open mm. uh, on the weekends. You can just ring the office or ring the, the library and ask them what their opening hours are. It's also a great museum down here too. You should oh, go and visit the museum. It's, it's an experience that you really need to, to go and have a look at. Um, they're usually open on major dog shows. So if you can get down here, I mean, I wish we could move the library for you to country areas, but it's a truly outstanding collection. Okay, this is, this is going to be the last question. I hope. Um, I've lost it now. Will training hours be retrospective? No, you don't. You, no, your hundred hours because it's been done over the last five years. You just, no, it's not. Yes, it is retrospective. You've done all the training. Yes, of course. You don't have to start from tonight and then build up another hundred hours. Yeah. We'd have nobody to test before Christmas if you all did that. <laughs> so, no, it is retrospective. We will credit you for all the thing. You just have to put it down on paper and have it so that we can verify it. Yeah. All right. All right. No more questions. All right, I'd like you all, um, there's a whole heap of thank yous online coming through to oh, Lee nice. and to OTEC, so I'd like to pass those on, but I think we can all thank Lee's done a wonderful job here tonight, giving you a bit of an insight. <laughs> and another huge thank you to Sue Squared, as we call them, Sue, Sue Collier and Sue Murray from OTEC. Um, <laughs> I get to stand up here, but they've done all the behind-the-scenes work. Dawn Aiton's here from OTEC, and we've got some of our master instructors. So is Nolene over there in the corner looking after registrations. Um, and we've got some of our master instructors here. They've already been through the scheme. Greg Bobbins here, Rosalie Gerlach, Rob, Rob Butler. Yeah. Who else is here? Can't see with the bright lights. But anyway, when we close down the live streaming, feel free to have a chat to them. They've been through the scheme. If you've got any questions, I'm sure they'll be happy to answer them. So thanks very much again, Lee. It's You're been welcome. a pleasure. Thank you.